Views expressed on this program are not necessarily those of Blue Ridge PBS, the Virginia Department of Education, or the Virginia Society for Technology and Education. Blue Ridge PBS, in partnership with the Virginia Department of Education and in collaboration with VISTI, the Virginia Society for Technology and Education, is talking to leading educators about what gets them energized and how technology is being used to inspire student engagement. This is Activated Learning. Thanks to the virtual reality, she was able to teach that and they were able to experience Machu Picchu walk around, walk up and down the stairs, you know, see the, the different slopes, see that it was sitting on the side of a mountain, that type of thing. And so, you know, it's that type of experience that we have been trying to foster and create with this type of technology. Welcome to Activated Learning, I'm Tom Landon. Today, we travel to the tip of the Commonwealth to visit with Logan Childress, an instructional technology resource teacher at Virginia High School, who's created a model virtual reality lab in both the high and middle schools there. We had a far-ranging conversation where he shared how the technology is evolving to vastly improve teaching and learning in the virtual world. I'm so happy to be here today at Virginia High School with Logan Childress, who uh, is an instructional technology resource teacher, but also has another title. Logan, uh, uh, tell me tell me about that other title. Yeah, it was the, the title that never left the email signature, but it was an emerging technology specialist which was a position that was uh, created here in Bristol City two years ago as part of uh, ESSER money to actually the project was, uh, the main project was building two rooms like the one you see here, one here at Virginia High School and a virtual reality lab like this one at Virginia Middle School. And I, I wanna, but that is the other thing I wanna do is be, we are at the high school, we know that, but tell me about this room, what's it used for and kind of, you know, what's its purpose? So this is the virtual reality lab. Um, uh, you can't see all of them, but there's 12 stations in here. And the goal is, is that we would be able to have a class of up to 24 students use this lab. Um, you know, virtual reality is not new by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I actually remember virtual reality booths and stuff at malls back in the late 90s. And you could do all kinds of stuff. You know, a lot of it was uh, fighting aliens, I think. But you, you could do a form of virtual reality. But, you know, it's really in the past couple of years started to become a thing in uh, education. And so the goal of these labs was to be able to provide students with experiences that they might not have otherwise. You know, we're, we are right near Tennessee. We're near North Carolina. We're near all these places. But that doesn't mean that, uh, that our students as a whole get to go, you know, very far from Bristol. So we wanted to be able to create, uh, be able to create experiences, even if virtual ones, for them so they can experience it. And uh, one of the great examples of that is uh, we had a teacher at our middle school who used to uh, use Machu Picchu in her lessons. And so uh, as a math teacher, uh, she was a math teacher, I always questioned when she would ask about Machu Picchu why, why that, you know, what that has to do with math because me, I, I didn't get it, right? And so anyway, she used that to teach slope and angle in her math class. And so in order to do that, she would just put up a photo on her board of Machu Picchu. And she said, it's okay, but I'd really like my students to experience it because they can't understand really what I'm talking about in you know, one dimension. So thanks to the virtual reality, she was able to teach that and they were able to experience Machu Picchu, walk around, walk up and down the stairs, you know, see the, the different slopes, see that it was sitting on the side of a mountain, that type of thing. And so, you know, it's that type of experience that we have been trying to foster and create with this type of technology. And, you know, Bristol is not rural, it is a city, but when you're out here and in our part of Virginia, a lot of the kids don't get, I mean, there are kids who won't, who haven't yet seen the ocean, you know? Well, uh, in fact, we had a, an event at our central office just last week and the guest speaker was asking some questions and, and he was actually from Glade Spring which is, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, that's about 20 minutes from Bristol up Interstate 81. Mm -hmm. And the number of students that were there was probably about 150 uh, for this particular uh, presentation. And I think when he asked how many students had been to Abingdon, it was about half had been to Abingdon, which was, that's about you know 12 minutes, 15 minutes from here. And then when he said, how many of you have ever been to Glade Spring? Again, 20 minutes, I bet there was 15 kids that raised their hand. So, you know, even though we're here, we're right at, the, you know, we're not far from Knoxville, we're not far from Roanoke, we're not far from many places, 
um, you know, just a good number of our students have never been very far from here to be able to have some experiences. Now, um, I, I, I want to talk about virtual reality and, and augmented here now, and we'll come back to some of the kind of biographical stuff that I also like to know about. But, uh, you know, I think it was probably eight years ago or so, maybe 10, when I visited Virginia Tech and the cave, which was their virtual reality environment, and the amount of computing power that it required for me to walk through a World War I um, uh, trench, you know, trench warfare. They, they, someone had spent a credible amount of money to develop this interactive thing where you could walk through there. Um, just how, how quickly is this technology changing and emerging that you could have it in, you know, a pretty normal high school in Virginia now? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's changed a lot. Uh, in fact, you know, what we have here, which is right at two years old, um, you know, they've now come out with multiple new headsets since then. And a lot of, a lot of the stuff that is coming out now is the, what they call the all-in-one, which is actually, you know, we have computers for all these <clears throat> high-powered gaming-style computers um, just because we want to be able to, if it can run on a Windows machine, we want to be able to push it to our headset. And so we didn't want to be kind of clamped down with some of the other headsets to where, you know, it had to be a, had to have certain specifications to run on all in one. But, um, you know, a lot of the all in ones now are starting to replace even the need for this, which is, you know, when you think about it, pretty incredible because these computers have a lot of components in them that, you know, they're large computers. They take up a lot of space. They take up a lot of computing power. And now we're shoving that all into a headset. Right. And, uh, uh, because a lot of our listeners, viewers are regular everyday classroom teachers and have a wide variety of, of knowledge bases, I'm going to ring my little uh, my, my uh, buzzword bell here, which uh, there we go. And I'm going to just ask you to uh, talk about the difference between virtual and augmented reality. Well, so virtual reality is more of a, a complete, you know, experience and an immersive experience. So when you're in virtual reality, a lot of times you, especially when we have people that are doing it for the first time, and, and believe it or not, even though it is very widespread, especially with things like the uh, MetaQuest and where you can buy this technology for yourself at home, uh, you know, we have a lot of students that uh, have never experienced this. And so we a lot of times actually have a situation where they will do some kind of virtual reality experience and they'll take the headset off and they won't realize that they've actually moved eight feet from where they were. They don't realize that people are still standing around them. It's, it's right. an and, all and immersive. That, and that's hence the, you've got your little, your stanchions and your, and your, your correct. Your, yes. Whatever uh, and those these are, are called these to are, keep kids in a safe space while they're doing right. it. Right. Um, and so, right. That was the goal with that is that's a, a fairly non-obtrusive way to, if you run into one of the, um, the belts of the stanchions, then you can feel kind of that pressure on your clothing and then know that you're moving. But, uh, you, you know, it's an all immersive experience. So when you take the headset off, there'll, there'll be a lot of times people, including adults, say, oh, I forgot you all were here, right? Because you're hearing things in the headset. You're seeing things all around. If you look up, it looks different than you're, you know, looking down. You can turn all the way around. You can look behind you. It's, it's again, an all immersive experience versus augmented reality, which one of the uh, I would think the most popular ones in education are probably called merge cubes. And so there are these little alien looking uh, foam cubes. And with those, they have different designs on each side. And you can use an iPad or an iPhone or Android tablet or whatever. You get their app and you can use that to create different things. So instead of the all immersive experience, you know, you can uh, look at the solar system by pointing it at a merge cube because it recognizes that pattern or whatever. You know, you can do all the stuff, but that's still a very kind of, uh, you know, two-dimensional thing. You you have to have the iPad. You have to see it. You're still aware of the world around you, um, you know. And so the big difference in those two, I think, is if you want the immersive experience, you have to have virtual reality. If you want a more uh, toned-down experience where kids can still experience something, especially it's really popular in the world of science, then you, you would use something like augmented reality. Okay. And uh, I always want to know how this, you know, what are the, the benefits and things to look out for for people who are considering this for kids who might have different needs in the classroom, kids with accommodations, um, 
you know, whether that be vision, hearing, you know, are there, are there things that, it, that you've noticed in your last couple of years of working with this where that can be either an issue or just a, a godsend? Well, I mean, certainly there's, there are parts of it that could be an issue. Um, you, you mentioned, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, students with different disabilities. You know, obviously, if there's a student that has, um, you know, vision problems, you know, this might not be the greatest of answers. Right. And I'm thinking about, you know, even myself, I wear glasses. Can you, can you know? Yeah. So anybody that has glasses, uh, as a rule, as long as the frames will fit, you know, sometimes, obviously, depending on what type of frames you have, they might not fit well in the headset. There are some things that you can do the headset. You actually can lengthen it to accommodate glasses. Okay. It also will accommodate different focal lengths, you know. Um, but one of the best stories that I have is we have a student, and uh, she, she came from elementary school uh, several years ago, and she was basically nonverbal, okay? And um, I like to tell this story a lot, but her, her teachers worked for her a lot on at least being able to communicate some things. You know, I need to use the restroom. I, you know, uh, I'm cold, I'm hot, you know, just simple things, right? Sure. And so um, what we did is is just for her to experience it, we put her into a, a, an experience in VR, and immediately after she was immersed and we were gone, you know, the the adults were gone. The other you were present, were but you were not we were present there. I mean, we were her, there, right? yeah. you know, we were seven feet away, we were there. But as soon as we were gone and she could hear what was taking place and see, she started talking to everything in the, and not just, you know, obviously a lot of times when we have nonverbal students, that's not saying that they can't speak or, or don't have the ability, it's just that they choose not to. And so she was waving to different characters in this. She was saying, hi bear, hi this, you know, oh, look at that, oh, look down here. Because she, we no longer had the, um, I guess the best way to put it would be social anxiety. Right. No, I mean, and, uh, and other people. Right. And so, uh, believe it or not, you know, it might seem small, but to a student like her and to her teachers, it was a big deal. After that, she started talking more. You know, she would have an experience in VR. She would talk to the characters in VR. And then actually that helped her start coming out of her shell a little bit in real life. And she would start being a little bit more vocal. A life. nice kind of you know, uh, gateway to, to communicating in school. That's, that's a great story. Yeah, um, and, we, and we also have, you know, there's other things that, you know, obviously you have to manipulate controllers, you have to manipulate buttons. So if you do have students with some motor, motor function problems, you know, that is a good way uh, for them to be able to work on different things with that, to being able to manipulate, um, you know, the technology in that way. I mean, there, you know, are there downsides? I'm sure. Have we really found any as far as that's concerned? No. And uh, just on a practical side from administrators who are watching this and thinking that'd be a cool thing to have, you know, in terms of uh, upkeep, breakage, uh, you know, just the technology side of it on, you know, you, you get a nice grant, you put a bunch of money into a lab like this or, or a smaller version of it. What do you have? What is, what is the obligation going forward? Well, that depends. Right. So the, the reason I say that depends is there – so our, our particular version of this, okay, we, we designed this lab um, from the ground up. You know, there was no – we didn't have a real concept of what we were doing. We knew some things we wanted to do, such as we don't want the all-in-one headsets. Um, we do have our TVs, and that allows teachers to see what the students see. That was one of my questions because I have seen situations with VR in the classroom where the teacher is kind of shut out from what's going on. Right. So that is actually the purpose of our TVs is what whatever is in the headset is also on the TV. Um, kids can be doing the same app. You know, they can be doing the same one all throughout the room. They all also each station can do its own. Um, and so we knew some things we wanted. We knew some things we didn't. We had a lot of uh, unknowns. And I do kind of tell this story sometimes. You know, we, we reached out to one of our suppliers that makes some of our equipment, just asking some questions. You know, obviously these people that make this stuff have documentation, right? They have specifications and how far this will reach or how this will work. And uh, we were, you know, we were very excited because they told us it wasn't what we wanted to do was not possible because they said having 12 stations 
in one room was unheard of. You know, the, the, the equipment was not built for it. It was built, you know, you might get four in one room if the room is big enough. So, you know, we went through all that. We bought applications. We used Steam, which is a gaming service. We bought applications. That's a one-time fee. Um, we have no recurring cost for this lab. And the reason I bring that up is there's a lot of uh, VR companies out there making great content. And the recurring cost, it's a yearly recurring cost, and it's prohibitive for a lot of school systems. Um, you know, there's, and I'm not, I don't want to get into who, but, you know, there's one company that makes some stuff, and it's great. It's fantastic. But you're looking at if you wanted your students to have, t you know, if you wanted to have 10 headsets and a couple different pieces of software on them, you're looking at 50 to 60, up to $100,000 a year. And, um, you know, that's especially for small school divisions so it's like just, ours. But it's just like anything else. You know, are, yeah. are, you, are you buying it or are you leasing renting, it, right. renting it? And, and Well, and of course, you know, that's the new model, right? We want the subscription model. It's the new thing. Um, so if you do it like this and you, you actually buy the hardware, we actually have had no recurring cost. Um, if you do some of the all-in-one, depending on what vendor you go through, you might have some small recurring costs or you might have a large recurring cost. So I, I'm not advocating for one or the other. Uh, I, you know, we've been very fortunate. We have not broken any headsets. We've broken no controllers, um, you know, some small computer issues. And I think that was just because we had these, these were built for us and shipped during you know, COVID when there was a lot of supply chain issues and some quality problems as I think we all ran into but um, you know for this if you're able to do something like this even at a small scale uh, I think you would find that the investment up front could be one of the only investments you make in it. I want to talk a little bit now about sort of um, your path to getting here because it, you are a, a, you were a music major band teacher by trade right and Correct. so uh, how did you how did you end up moving over to the technology side? Um, as we all know, COVID came about, and that was very difficult on education as a whole. Um, you know, we all know that. But it was also very difficult for music education and uh, not having students in school and, 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 you know, being in and out and some virtual, some not. You know, that was, that was difficult on a lot of music programs. And any, any music educators listening to this, I, I know, agree with me on that. But um, so it was just a, a situation where I just kind of decided maybe it was time to look at doing something else. And so the opportunity came about here in Bristol, Virginia Public Schools. And um, so I've been here ever since. Right. And I think, um, you know, we talked about this a little bit before we started rolling. You know, there, if you're a teacher who absolutely loves what you're doing, um, then keep doing it right but if it you know i think it's you do no one a service if you find yourself unhappy in your job to look for another job because especially if you can stay in education we have such such trouble retaining and attracting good talent so i'm, I'm glad you were able to make that well switch. and, and uh, kind of like i mentioned earlier um you know i really kind of took it to heart years ago whenever my mother who was a classroom teacher uh, when she, one, of, one of the original instructional one technology of the original research, ITRT's research 20, teachers. 2004, uh, when she moved after, I believe it was 25 years in the classroom as an elementary teacher um, to being an ITRT during the first year or perhaps the pre-year, as we discussed, you know, not totally sure, but it was in 2004 when she moved and she came up with the philosophy that, you know, about every 10 years would be good to do something else if possible. Not a new career per se, but just maybe a new job in the same industry right or at least to do a little inventory right am i am i is this job what it was when i started do i still like it i still want to be around kids i still want to be in a school how can i do that and and uh, i know from going to conferences like visti you know the the conf uh, conference is full of people who used to be something else in a school division right. and then they they found themselves gravitating one of the things we talk about a lot is is that um especially for for I mean, this is a little ageist to say, older teachers, but also just teachers who haven't been a part of technology or have learned the bare minimum. When you talk to somebody about using a new technology, whether it's cutting edge or not, um, I always think of that teacher who's almost f afraid to touch it, 
right? Whether that's a drone or whether that's a robot or whether that back in the early days of, you know, like opening up a new application or using opening a digital email. camera. Right. I mean, how do you work with um, teachers to help them overcome that fear that they're going to break something if they touch it? Well, I think that actually used to be a little harder than it is now. Right. Um, and I think the one the one thing that has really done us a great service actually is the, uh, you know, the advent. Uh, it feels like a long time ago now, but not that long ago of smartphones and tablets and, and uh, personal laptops at home. And, um, of course, you know, software companies, hardware companies have gone to a lot of extent, it seems, in the past several years to make sure that, you know, they build in some safeguards. So, you know, I, I don't think that's... Obviously, that's still a, that's still a concern when we, you know, talk to someone that's maybe not as sure about technology. And I think that actually goes for anybody, really. You know, we do have younger people that are very unsure about technology as well. But working with uh, anybody who's older, you know, generally, in my experience, if you are willing to show them a couple times, then they're okay with it. And that's the thing, too. You know, it's, but it's, 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 um, it's on both sides, right? The person who's doing the right. teaching has to be patient. Right. And uh, I think it's also, you know, you also find that there, that some people are much more willing to take the risk and we'll, we'll just kind of do it. And others, you know, you have to kind of coax or perhaps help on multiple occasions or, but I, I do think it has gotten better. I, I remember uh, I would stay after school because my, my mom was the ITRT at the same high school I went to. I would stay after school, you know, with her to ride home. And she would be working on different things. And that was back when, you know, everything was kind of new. I mean, not super new, but, you know, you were given No, up, but there was a time when we had to go program. out into schools and teach right. people how to use a Sony Mavica camera or, you know, people who had only been using film strip right. and, and uh, that kind of stuff. You know, so I remember just it was almost everybody was hesitant because you might have, you know, you were installing a program off a CD, right, and the person was even hesitant mm -hmm. to open the CD after you put it in the drive to install the program. And, and of course, installing was not always that simple. You might have to run three or four different things. And right. so it I remember was, that. It was I, a lot guess, more complicated back then. I guess for me, I just think about the difference in now and then. And so, you know, I, so, I think so about it in, in the terms of relate in relation. It's, it's definitely a lot better than it used to be. So you're a lot younger than I am, but... Um, I want to talk about one of the reasons I wanted to come here is because just in our conversations by email, I could, I could tell you had some interesting thoughts and, and, uh, were there experiences in your own elementary, junior high, middle school, high school experience where, with, with, uh, technology that stand out to you? Do you remember the first time a teacher did something or? Well, I, I remember I went to Valley Institute Elementary School. And uh, the school has changed a lot now, and so I, I don't even know if this is still a thing, but in front of the gym at the time, there was a computer lab, and and we would go there every once in a while and play. Right, it was special to go use the computer. It was very special. So. Uh, we would go play, like, Oregon Trail. Oregon Trail. You know, um, and that was kind of it. That was kind of the extent of it. You know, I, I don't, I don't think we had any kind of classroom computers at all doesn't strike me that we did. I could be wrong about that. Um, and then I went to middle school. And in middle school, you could actually take some computer courses. Um, you know, really it was for keyboarding. It was like the new age typewriting class, right? The, you know, keyboarding class. And um, I do recall we started a, uh, there was about, I don't know, maybe 10 of us, maybe less. We actually started the, I think it was the first or one of the first student-led websites. Um, and we did the school newspaper on it. And we used, um, and I could be wrong, I think it was Front Page. Front Page, Page in. Maker, those were all the ones that we used right. in schools, yeah. And then when uh, I was in high school, that was at the point uh, the school system was going through a lot of changes with their websites. And so at the high school at the time, you could take, again, more computer classes. I mean, things obviously were advancing. More computer classes, and so I took some of those classes, but. The main thing I remember about that actually was helping my mom uh, create uh, the website for High Point Elementary. 
at the time. And, of course, that was all when you had to maintain everything by hand. You know, if you wanted to add a new page, you had to go get the template. You had to manually You probably needed to know at least a little bit of HTML and, uh, and, to do it. Right. And everything at the time, they were all using Dreamweaver. That was, mm-hmm. the, that was mm-hmm. the most popular one at the time. And uh, then we also worked on creating uh, the website for John Battle High School. That, of course, you know, that's many years ago, and it's gone through several no, major but revisions. No, but you, you but strike me as one of those kids. I remember when I first started teaching at a high school level, like that school didn't run ex- uh, uh, technology-wise except that they would hire a few kids uh, – to and they were they really helped in the summer they would update software yeah. they would run around but they also maintained a website and what the old rule back then was like you know if you ca- catch a kid messing with your technology at the school level trying to get into your network or something you hire that kid yeah. and put them to work and um i think there's less dependence on that now in schools i might be wrong but uh, well, I do know, know, we, for we instance, ran on students when I was uh, at William Fleming High School. So we had some visitors here last year from Cumberland County, and I believe they still rely quite a lot on, uh, they, I think they call them student interns, and um, in, in place of like having, uh, because they're a small school system like us, instead of having extra ITRTs or extra technicians, they actually have, um, you know, students that are proficient in maybe 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, that that's for a class period or two a day, they're the technology intern. And it's going to be interesting to see, because you were talking about keyboarding. I remember when that was a big push. Every kid's going to take keyboarding, and that wasn't that long ago. And now, you know, every kid is going to learn to code starting. They're going to at least get familiar with principles in early elementary school. And so you're going to see these kids coming up um, who are really remarkable, I think. Are you starting to see that at your level now at the high school? Honestly? It's okay. You be honest. Yeah, (laughs) maybe you're not. Uh, No. If you, if you see these students in the hallways, it's on their phone. If you see them outside of school, they're on their phone. I don't, I don't I, you know, that's, that's always been my thing. Uh, I think the coding thing is great, and I think everybody should be proficient on using computers before they leave school. And, and a lot of kids, you know, they figure out things very fast. But uh, I think if we'll just make them code on their phone, that would be me. It'll, it's, I think it's going to be really interesting to watch and see what happens to these kids at least those who take an interest in the coding, because it hasn't been that long since we've been requiring it. It'll be but interesting. I, but I think that's also a good point is, you know, if you had an interest, if you have an interest in technology, you will take an interest in the coding. I, and I do think a lot of it, too, is that this idea that, like, if what you have is working for you, if everything on your, you know, if you're using your phone it's and, and you don't have any needs, when we learn is when there's something we need to learn. Right? Well, and actually, I think that's, Maybe one of the big downfalls of phones and tablets is, you know, uh, as Apple says, it just works, right? Made it too easy. And it's too easy. Yeah, yeah. Well, not to end on a downer note, but uh, but I, I think I, I think that's I think as we talk about policies and plans for the future, that's a perspective we don't often hear. I think it's it, I think it'll be interesting to see where things go from here. Um, again, Logan, thanks for taking the time. It. For those of you, who you're, there's no way of you knowing this because you're watching this in the future from today, but it is election day, and this should be your day off. So thank you for coming into school on no your problem. day off. And, uh, and stay in touch, and uh, I look forward to seeing what cool thing you guys come up with next. All right. Thank you, Tom. This is Activated Learning from Blue Ridge PBS in partnership with the Virginia Department of Education and in collaboration with Visti. If you like what you hear, subscribe to Activated Learning wherever you get your podcasts. If you've got an idea for an upcoming show, let us know at activatedlearning at blueridgepbs.org. Activated Learning was created by Blue Ridge PBS in partnership with the Virginia Department of Education and in collaboration with the Virginia Society for Technology and Education. Produced by Tom Landon, Director of Educational Innovation at Blue Ridge PBS, with a lot of help from graphic and audio designer Jay Prater, podcast studio producers Andy DePew and Kurt Schruth, and Vice President of Education Dr. Rose Martin. Our theme music was composed and produced by Ryan Champney and Dr. Matt Katatechea of VISTI.